All right, so. Isaiah 62. Calling all harlots. Uh, turn to Isaiah 62. And I'm going to start this real quick. Starting with verse 1. Is everybody there? No. <clears throat> okay. Oh, that's a nice breeze coming in there. <laughs> okay. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, <laughs> neither shall thy land be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hesephah, which means my delight is in her, and thy land Beulah, which means a land that is married. For the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoice over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I have set watchmen upon my walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night, that you make mention of the Lord and keep not silent. Give him no rest until he establish and until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the stranger shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast labored. <laughs> but they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people, cast up, cast up the highway, Gather out the stones and lift up a standard for the people. Behold, the Lord is proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say you to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation comes, and behold, his reward is with him, and his work is before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and thou shalt be called sought out a city not forsaken. So no longer will you be termed desolate. We are called the redeemed of the Lord. Here's the problem. This is why God is saying this. His delight is in you, and you'll be married to him. And i got to get a bigger one. <laughs> this is not good. Word. <laughs> but in Hosea 2, 1 through 7, I want to read that right after that, because this is very, very important. So God says that you will be called a royal, you're a royal diadem in the hand of your God. What's a diadem? A diadem is a crown. You are a royal crown in the hand of your God. And God will present you as a royal crown in his hand, a royal diadem of beauty. And I'm going to go into what that means in just a second. Go to Hosea 2. I want to rush through this. It's very, very important. This has to do with our sanctification. And I really, really want you to study these, okay? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, I made some copies, and I'll show you why, what you're going to, you know, the different definitions and things like that. Hosea 2. 1 through 7. Say unto your brethren, Ami, and your sisters, Ruma, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither, neither am I her husband. Let therefore her put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born and make, her a, and, and make her as a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they are the children of whoredoms, for their mother hath played this harlot. Now I'm going to read you what this means, okay? That she conceived them and hath done shamefully, for she said, I will go after my lovers that give my bread over and my water over and my wool over and my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. So everything that God has supplied for her, she's just letting everybody else have it. She's giving it away. She's, she doesn't count it as 
uh, something that God had given her for herself. She's just loose with everything that God's given her. Okay? Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns, and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not... Wow. She shall not overtake them, and shall seek them, but shall not find them. And then she shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better <laughs> with her first husband than it is now. Who do you think her first husband was? For she did not know. This is God speaking. She did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil, and I multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Everything that God gave her, she thought it was coming from the God she was worshiping, which is Baal. Do you know the name Baal in the Hebrew form and also Greek means husband or lover or Lord? So it was, it was a, the, 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 God, the God of Baal was a form, because they were worshiping that God, it was like that God was their provider. But God was the one that was giving her the oil and the wine and the corn. And she it says she did not know. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season. And I will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. Verse 10. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. I will also cause all of her myrrh to cease, her feast days, her new moons, and her Sabbaths, and her solemn feasts. How many know he's talking about Israel? Mm -hmm. How many know that we are Israel? Okay. Verse 12, I, and I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. Because she did not know that God was providing for her, even in the wilderness. And she's saying, My lovers have given me this. So she's forgotten God, the God of her youth. She's forgotten <coughs> him. And this is what's happening right now in the United States of America. A lot of people, when they're young, have served the Lord and the Lord, and they're now following after their lovers. They're following after <coughs> marijuana. They're following after cocaine. They're following after alcohol. They're following after sex. They're following, you know what I'm saying? All these different things uh, to, to take their time and different desires, they're running after. And that's spiritual adultery. It said, and these are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them for a forest, and beasts of the field shall eat them. Verse 13. And I will visit upon her as in the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them. Hello? Mm -hmm. She burned incense to them. You know marijuana is a form of incense that you burn to a god? You realize that? Uh, anything you're smoking... <laughs> It's, it's, it's incense that's being burned, okay? And she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, says the Lord. Verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her. This is so amazing to me. This is what I love about the book of Hosea. Even though she forgot God, and, she, and everything that she was receiving, she thought was coming from her lovers. She thought they were providing for her. And even though God knew that he was the one providing for her, and she thought it was her lovers that was doing it, and she was serving all of her lovers and other gods and different forms of uh, <laughs> whatever, she was, whatever was appeasing her, whatever was giving her comfort. And here's God says, but that's okay. I'm going to allure her. He's still going to woo her and bring her back into the wilderness so he can speak comfortably to her and kindly to her. I don't know about you, but when I got saved when I was young, I fell away from the Lord, and, and I had all these desires. I was broken. I wanted to be loved, and I was following after all these men <laughs> that I thought could, could fill that void in me. Relationships, you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about going out and having sex. Even emotional relationships mm -hmm. uh, did something for me at that time because I was so broken. <laughs> you know, I didn't want them to get too close. But attention was nice because of everything that I had gone through. And so getting attention even from, you know, the things that we put our time to, our phone, television, all these things that make us feel comfortable, all these things that take time away from our intimacy with Christ is a form of spiritual adultery. And it goes a lot deeper than just the basic, uh, basic uh, you know, things in life that we do. It goes a lot deeper than that. And it'll grab a hold of everything that we have. But here's God. He says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably to her. Verse 15. And I will give her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
The valley of Achor is the valley of weeping. And God says, I'm even going to put a door of hope in the place that she is weeping. And the place that she realizes that she can be nothing without God. And the place that she comes back to him and says, okay, it's not God who's, it's not my lovers who's supplying all of these things. It is God. And then she misses her first husband. She said it's better to go back to her first husband than the state that she's in now. So she, he puts a door of hope in the valley of weeping. I don't know about you, but I was there. That's how God found me. I knew who he was. I knew I wasn't doing right. I knew I was running from him. Okay, and, and a lot of us are in the church doors in leadership and still running from God. What do you mean by that? Exactly what I'm saying. You can be a leader in the church and, 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 and perform and do all the things you think you're supposed to do and still be running from God and still be in spiritual adultery because your heart doesn't belong to Him. The Bible says in German, you're, 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 your lips praise me all day long, but your heart is far from me. What does that mean? That means they're constantly talking about God and praising God everywhere they go, but their heart is far from Him. It's far from Him. Having a form of godliness, yet denying His power, yet denying who He is, is the same thing. It's spiritual adultery. It's rampart in the church. It's not the world I'm talking about here. It's not the world God's talking about. The one who was saved and is going after her lovers. Mm -hmm. So He lures her, okay, and speaks comfortably to her, and gives her vineyards, wow, <laughs> and a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. Wow, I want the song of my youth back. I don't know about you, <laughs> but I'm going to sing there as in the days of my youth. You know, and a lot of times, you know, we fall away because of the things that we've gone through. We don't know what it is to receive real love, so we run from God because His love is so overwhelming. It's so life-changing and overwhelming and transforming that we don't want it because it's too good. <laughs> and we only know a form of love that only, that only supplies just enough. And too much more than that makes us uncomfortable because we know we are not worthy. And this is, this is what we're talking about here with Hosea when he married Gomer. Can you imagine she's a prostitute? She's a harlot. And how many know that the book of Hosea, what we talked about a couple weeks ago, Hosea, the book of Hosea is God's heart for Israel. Through that relationship, he portrays his heart in a metaphor, in an allegory, if you will. His heart for Israel. Though she's a harlot running after her lovers, he's chasing after her because of his love for her and wants her back, cleans her up, picks her up, sets her on a rock, and, and delivers her. And loves her. Can you imagine? It's amazing to me. So a door of hope. And she'll sing there as in the days of her youth. And in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Which we know is a land of bondage, right? Verse 16. And it shall be at that day, says the Lord, that you shall no more call me Ish. That you shall call me Ish and shall no more call me Baal. <laughs> so... This is the foundational scripture of Lilies of the Valley that God gave me in 2006. Okay? No longer shall you call him Baal, but he shall be called Ish. Ish means my husband. So now you will call him Ish, that is my husband, and Baal was my lord or master. So you go from calling a Baal, Bali, B A L L I, not the same form of Baal in the prior scripture. Master, you go from saying master <laughs> to a more intimate relationship with who he is and he's your husband. So you call him your husband. He's coming into that place in your brokenness, into the valley of weeping. He's coming into that place with you and becoming intimate with you and, and picking you up and rescuing you. Like Gomer went and got Hosea out of the mud when she slept with all these men and even had babies from other men. He goes and he finds her in the dung heaps and picks her up and cleans her off and even reclothes her. <laughs> it's a perfect form. It's a perfect form of God's love. It's a perfect explanation of who he is. That's what he does, doesn't he? He finds those who are the furthest. Oh, his hand is not too short to save, right? The deepest, the ones who are deepest in the deepest places. 
You know that song that says he he had to go way down <laughs> to get me. Yeah. So verse 17, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. So deliverance, divine deliverance. He will surround you with songs of deliverance. There's a divine deliverance that comes through intimacy with the Lord, and he will cleanse you of all of that. He'll cleanse you of everything that came on you from all of your lovers, everything that you gave your time and your attention to. And they shall no more be remembered. This is idolatry. The things that they, I just I just really want you to capture what his heart on this. And verse 18, and in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and I will make them to lie down safely. Verse 19, and I will betroth thee unto me forever. <laughs> So God says he will betroth you. Betrothal is a marriage. Betrothal is a covenant that cannot be erased. He will betroth you unto himself forever. Forever. That's amazing to me. And you will betroth thee unto me. In, he'll betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment. Wow. In righteousness and in judgment. And in loving kindness and in mercies. He's betrothing you in judgment, in righteousness, in loving kindness, and mercy. He's a good husband. He's a good husband. And verse 20, and he goes on to say, And I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou wilt know the Lord. And he said, basically, you're going to know me now. You're going to know me. He's going to make himself known to you. That's amazing to me. One of the Father's greatest desires is that we know Him. One of the Lord's greatest desires is that we know Him. Because what was the verse we read prior to that? For she did not know. She did not know that I gave her corn and oil and wine. And a lot of these women out here, they don't know that the Lord has provided all these things. They think that they're getting this stuff that they need from the world. Because they don't know that God is the one supplying it. How many were out there before you were serving God? You knew God was doing stuff for you. You knew it had to be God. Mm -hmm. And he was still providing for you when you weren't even serving him. He was still making a way for you. Because this is what he's doing. This is the picture. He's drawing you unto himself. And, and there's, there's the judgment. I believe the betrothal, the righteousness, and the judgment. There's a certain things in us that have to be judged so they can be corrected. <laughs> That's sanctification. God shows us who he is and we come into that place with him like a mirror and we see all the darkness that we have. I mean, Barb and I went through a real, mostly her for that one week, went through a real consecration because God was showing her some things that was in her that she had to face. Why? Because he's moving in closer and closer and closer and the closer he comes in through that intimacy, you, you come to know him in a greater way. Deeper and deeper and deeper, the more he exposes in us that needs to be changed. So in faithfulness, he'll betroth us, and we'll know the Lord. Verse 21, it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, and I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. Wow. Signs and wonders. That is so amazing to me. God's going to open up your ears. A divine hearing is going to come. When you're in covenant relationship with Jesus and you're in a betrothal in a marriage and you know you're his wife and you belong to him, something happens to you. It's a confidence and it opens up your ears to hear. And you stay in that place. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Wow. This is one of my favorite verses. Mm -hmm. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Wow. And I will sow her unto me in the earth. Sow. You're like a seed that God is going to sow you and him together in the earth. When he sows you in the earth, when you come up and you begin to produce fruit, you become a seed and you become to produce fruit for the kingdom. And now you're bearing his children. <laughs> 
You're not just uh, betrothed to him and married to him, but you're coming into a place where you're producing for him. You're producing fruit, a fruit that will remain. So he's going to sow you in the earth. How can I share this? Because I walked through it. I lived it. I know exactly what he's talking about here because this was who I was. This is what God brought me through. I knew him as a, as a child. You know, I, I had a very, very awesome relationship. He visited to me when I was seven years old. So, And then I walked away from him for a season. You see what I'm saying? So this is kind of what happened in my life. And this is why he gave me a revelation of it. Now he has sown me in the earth. He's sown me unto himself. He says, I will sow you unto me. Mm. Bark. <laughs> I mean, how can you not weep over that? And I will have mercy upon her that didn't ha obtain any mercy. <clears throat> Things we've been through, we didn't have mercy. Mm. What's mercy? No one cared. No one cared about how they treated us or what they did to us. You know, nobody cared. But God did, because he knew you didn't have, he, you didn't obtain mercy. So he said, I'll show mercy in you because you had no mercy. And I will say to them, which are not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. Mm. So now we come into this place and we say, You're, you are my God. Because now we come into a union with him. Now we have an understanding. So this is the whole point that God wants to take us into with lilies of the valley. And the women out there, they don't know. They don't know that he gave them corn and oil and wine. They don't know that he's the one that's been supplying for them while they're running after their lovers. His love for them is greater than we could ever have for them. We don't even love them the way <laughs> it can never happen, Barb. As much love as we feel we have and we're weeping, that's the heart of God for those women out there. And you know what? There's not a whole lot that will do this, that will take this, because a lot of them are so full of religion, even the ones in the church, they have no understanding that they're living in spiritual adultery. They don't even know what it is. And I really feel the call for us. That that's something that we have to tell them. We have to show them. And that's why it's important that we continue to, to teach this and to get it out there because no one's really teaching it right now. <laughs> you know, it's really, really important because how many know that without, you can have all the knowledge you want, bah, 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 with no understanding, it doesn't work. That's right. Knowledge puffs up, but the Spirit gives life, and only the Spirit can give you understanding of what's really happening. And so, <laughs> I, I just have to share this with you here in, in Jeremiah chapter 2. And I'm just going to read it. It's a lot, so you don't really have to go there. But this is where uh, God is talking to his the one he betrothed who went out and went after her other lovers. And this is uh, the amplified version of Jeremiah 2, also 3 and 10. So you can read it on your own time. But I really want to read you this form what of is it. it. Jeremiah? Jeremiah chapter 2, 1 through 3, and then Jeremiah 10. It's a lot, so I'm going to go over this. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1. The Lord spoke to me. He said, Go and declare in the hearing of the people of Jerusalem. He's telling Jeremiah, go declare this. Okay? How many know that the, that the word is like a, it's a prophecy for today? Just about everything you read in the word has come full circle. You know, you see certain things in the word that are coming to pass even now. You're like, wow, that's in the word back in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. It's happening right now. This is what the Lord says. I have fond memories of you. How devoted you were to me in your early years. I remember how you loved me like a new bride. You followed me through the wilderness, through a land that had never been planted. Israel was set apart to the Lord. They were like the first fruits of a harvest to him. And all who tried to devour them were punished. And disaster came upon them, says the Lord. Verse 4, now listen to what the Lord has to say, you descendants of Jacob, all you family groups from the nation of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault could your ancestors have possibly found in me that they had strayed so far from me? It's happening today, guys. I know you guys look a little bit shocked right now. <laughs> it's in the church. We have fallen away from God. We have fallen so far. <laughs> and all he's saying is, come back to me. Come back to me. Let go of what's going on around you. You know, sometimes we need to just let go of our bills and worry about our bills all the time. 
because we give that more time and more aspect and more credit than we do trusting God. That he said, he, look at the, he provides for the birds in the air. He provides for them. And I heard this the other day, and I want to share this because it was really, really powerful. I think it was Melissa Hessler and Jonathan and Melissa Hessler. Uh, and they were out in the woods, and, and, and uh, she was sitting there, and God was like, and there's trees all around her. It's like a forest. And God spoke to her and said, do you think any one of these trees worried about how they were going to grow? <laughs> worried about if the rain was going to come? No, they just grew. <laughs> And God supplied everything that those trees needed to grow. And they didn't worry. And I know it's easier said than done, but we've got to come into a place where we have 100% trust. Because if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Especially in this time. For your ancestors paid allegiance to worthless idols and so became worthless to me. They did not ask, where is the Lord who delivered us out of Egypt and who brought us through the wilderness? through a land of desert sands and rift valleys, through a land of drought and deep darkness, through a land in which no one travels and where no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land so you can enjoy its fruits and all of its rich bounty. But when you entered my land, you defiled it. You made my land, the land I call my own, loathsome to me. And your priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those responsible for teaching my, my word did not really know me. Your rulers rebelled against me, and all your prophets prophesied in the name of God Baal. They all worshipped idols that could not help them. So once more I will state my case against you, says the Lord. I will also state it against your children and your grandchildren. Go west across the sea to the coast of Cyrus and Sea. Send someone east to, to Kedar and have them look carefully. See if a thing as this has ever happened. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are not really gods at all? But my people have exchanged me, their glorious God, for a God that cannot help them at all. Be amazed at this, O heavens, and be shocked and utterly dumbfounded, says the Lord, because my people have committed a double wrong. They have rejected me, the fountain of life-giving water, and they have dug cisterns for themselves and cracked cisterns which can't even hold water. Israel is not a slave, is he? He was not born into slavery, was he? If not, why then is he being carried off? Like lions, his enemies roar victoriously over him. They raise their voices in triumph. They have laid this land, his land waste, and his cities have been burdened and burned down and deserted. Even the soldiers have cracked your skulls, people of Israel. You have brought all this upon yourself by deserting the Lord your God when he was leading you along the right path. What good will it do for you to go down to Egypt to seek all help, your help from the Egyptians? To seek your help from the chariots? What good will it do for you to go over to Assyria to seek help from the Assyrians? For your own wickedness will bring about your punishment. Your unfaithful acts will bring down discipline upon you. Know then and realize how utterly harmful it was for you to reject me, says the Lord. To show no respect, says the Lord, or honor for the Lord God who rules over you and gives you all things. Indeed, long ago you threw off my authority and you refused to be subject to me. You said, I will not serve you. Instead, you gave yourself to other gods on every high hill and under every green tree, like a prostitute sprawls out before her lovers. I planted you in the land like a special vine of the very best stock. Why in the world have you turned it into something like a wild vine that produces rotten, foul-smelling grapes? You can try to wash away your guilt with a strong detergent. You can use much soap as you want, but the stain of your guilt is still there for me to see, says the Lord. How can you say I have not made myself unclean, that I have not paid allegiance to the gods called Baal? Just look at the way you have behaved. <laughs> Think about the things you have done. For you are like a flighty young female. A flighty young female camel that rushes here and there, crisscrossing its path. You are like a wild female donkey that was brought up into the wilderness. In her lust, she sniffs the wind to get the scent of the male. No one can hold her back when she is in heat. 
None of, ma none of these males need to wear themselves out chasing after her. At mating time, mating time she is easy to find. This is very prophetic to where we're at right now in the church. Okay? I want you to take this personal. I really, really, really do. Because this is a serious thing that we're about to do and commit to the Lord. And we have got to be 100% there. Because you can be somewhere and not really be there. You've got to be 100% there. You've got to be all in or not at all. Because it wouldn't... I wouldn't be doing what I'm called to do, my job, if I didn't tell you that. Yeah, I love you and I want the best for you. But it's about God. And what He says. And it's holiness. He's bringing us into a place where we really know who He is. And it's really important. And it's okay if you don't want it. Nothing I can do about it. I'm just doing what I know I'm called to do. Do not chase after other gods until your shoes wear out and your throats become dry. But you say it is useless for you to try and stop me because I love those foreign gods and I want to pursue them. Just as a thief has to suffer dishonor when he is caught, so the people of Israel will suffer dishonor for what they have done. They say to their wooden idols, you are my father. They say to the stone image, you gave birth to me. Yes, they have turned away from from me instead of turning to me. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, Come and save us, O God. <laughs> but where are your gods that you made for yourselves? Let them save you when you are in trouble. The sad fact is that you have many gods, <laughs> just as you have many towns. Why do you try to refute me? All of you have rebelled against me, says the Lord. It did no good for me to punish you or your people. They did not respond to such correction. You slaughtered all my prophets that I sent to you, like a vicious, vicarious lion. You people of this generation, listen to what the Lord says. Have I been like a wilderness to you, Israel? Have I been like a dark and dangerous land to you? Why then did you say, we are free to wander, and we will not come to you anymore? Does a young woman forget to put on her jewels? Does a bride forget to put on her bridal attire? But my people have forgotten me. For more days than can ever be even be counted. How good you have become at chasing your lovers. America. <laughs> you could teach even a prostitute. Even your clothes are stained with the lifeblood of the poor who do not who had not done anything wrong. You did not catch them breaking into your homes, yet in spite of all these things that you have done, you say, I have not done anything wrong, so the Lord cannot really be angry. Mm -hmm. But watch out. <laughs> You've committed it. You've committed the sin. And why do you constantly go about changing your political allegiances? You have had sex with other gods. That is why the rains have been withheld and the spring rains have not come. I sent them, but your sin has resulted in fortune. Yet in spite of this, you are obstinate as a prostitute. You refuse to be ashamed of what you have done. And even now you say to me, you are my father. You have been my faithful companion ever since I was young. You will not always be angry with me, will you? You will not be mad at me forever, will you? That is what you say, but continually you do evil as you can before me. But even after you have done all that, I thought and believed and hoped that you might come back to me. But even as her sister, unfaithful Judah, saw what she did, she also saw 
wayward Israel, and her divorce papers were sent away because of her adulterous worship of other gods. Even after her unfaithful sister Judah had seen this, she still was not afraid, and she too went and gave herself like a prostitute to other gods. Because she took her prostitution so lightly, she defiled the land through her adulterous worship. And in spite of all this, Israel's sister, an unfaithful Judah, has not turned back unto me with any sincere turned back unto me with any sincerity. She has only pretended that she has done so. And this right now is the state. Is the state that we are in as Christians. And we take it so lightly. We don't talk about it anymore. You don't hear it at the pulpit anymore. You don't hear it preached about the blood. You don't hear it preached about, you know, uh, forgiveness of sins and, and repentance. You don't hear it anymore for some reason. And it's really, really important. I am a God. <laughs> Though seeing all this. <laughs> and who will send you warnings because of my great love for you. And even through Hosea's warnings to Israel. I will serve as a president for the present day church. How many know the church is the bride of Christ? And a lot of people preach against it, but the church is the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. That's right. It's not a building. <laughs> so even though it's a representation of the bride of Christ, but the validation of Israel's covenant status with the Lord continues. Even though the sin was there and he showed us what we were doing, his covenant of love, when he allured her back into the wilderness, he wanted her. He still desires her. He wants her back. He brings her in. And he speaks comfortably to her, kindly to her. He says, this is what you're doing because he is truth. He's all truth. This is what you're doing and this is what you've been doing. But I'm going to allure you back because I want you into the wilderness, and I'm going to give you a door of hope in the valley of your weeping. Covenant mm -hmm. through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because the future is based on, the new covenant is based on the covenant God made with us through Christ Jesus. So even though we are doing that, and God is showing us that, we can come back through the blood of Christ and be cleansed and washed and 100% made whole and clean. But the problem is that somebody needs to let someone know they're living in spiritual adultery because they are. They're giving their time and attention to all these other things. And God wants us to understand we can't play around with this thing anymore. We cannot do that. I'm not saying that you here are doing that. But we are a message to them. Mm -hmm. And we will be held accountable. Like I'm always telling the girls, Destiny, you most than ever. I always told them from the time they were little, I'm not going to be there with you when you stand before God on Judgment Day. You can't say, oh, Mom, what, you know what, <laughs> Mom, Mom. No. You're going to be by yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to answer to God by yourself. And that's why I always told them, talk to God about it. Go to God. I'm your mother. I can comfort you. I can be there for you. I can be, you know, counsel you or whatever. But God's the one that you answer to. He's your counselor. <laughs> right? And, that, and that's what we need to tell people. It's so important because when you come into this, it's like, you know, oh, this sounds fun. This is like, this is like a, a Holy Ghost hoedown. We're going to have a wedding. No. This is holy. You know, and I've been drilling you guys in this. And so is Barb. With just everything God's been giving us, we've been drilling you. And this is the ones he wants here, so it's all about him. You know, like Chelsea was asking me today, um, you know, what if someone comes in towards the end and wants to come in and hasn't heard all this stuff? And I told her, I said, God said, well, that they can come in because he's been grooming them. He brought them at that point. He's been grooming them. It's about him. But this is what God has given to us for now. So, because of his covenant... In 2.14, he will allure her, lead her back into the wilderness, speak tenderly to her, give her vineyards in the valley of weeping, an opportunity for hope. How many know some of the greatest evangelism, I don't like to really call it evangelism, but I guess it is, is going into the wilderness and finding somebody and giving them hope 
It's like you run into somebody and then you say something and they all of a sudden have hope. I mean, that's how we found one another. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we gave each other hope. And we needed that hope at that moment. And that's what those, the women out there, the people out there, that's what they need. They need that word of hope. The Lord is the one who's given that hope because he puts it on our heart to even talk to that person. Or we wouldn't even be able to. A lot of us think it's us, and it's not. It's his idea. It's his heart. It's his voice. He's the one that's speaking through us. Right? The Lord puts things on your heart. You don't say it unless he does, right? You know when you mess up and you say something that wasn't led of him. I know I do. I'm like, oh, I wasn't. <laughs> that wasn't God. <laughs> but then you know when he puts that love and that conviction on your heart. And you're just like the, the young lady you met that looked like my friend Anita. You oh, met her. Yeah. It was like you gave her that hope. You know? And who knows what she was going through? Who knows how she was feeling? But God knew. And so this is that hope. And that she will sing there like she did as a child. When we were little girls, man, nothing stopped us, right? I remember being out and <laughs> just singing all day long, just outside singing, you know, just all isolated by myself, singing songs to Jesus and singing. We were awesome when we were young. We had such a heart for the Lord. You may not think about it or know it, but you did. Some of us had climbed trees and just talked to Jesus. It was like he was our best friend. You know, and that's what God wants to take us back to. Having total and complete trust as a child in who he is. So, y'all may not understand this, but maybe you will. The other day, the Lord gave me like a simulation. It was like a, um, a how many of the simulation is? It's kind of like a vision, but it's a dream, vision dream. And uh, all I can recall is I kept hearing that scripture in the, in the book of Matthew that, that talks about when, uh, when Mary, it's in the book of Luke too, when Mary was pregnant, very, very pregnant. <clears throat> And the inn was, you know, the inn that they were looking for, they, it was full. They had no room, and there was nowhere for the master, the Lord, the baby. There was nowhere for him to lay his head, okay? And I thought about that, and it came to me in this vision. I was like, God, and he took me to this scripture right here, and I'm going to read it. And it is, wow, Matthew uh, 8, verse 20. And I've seen this, I want to read it really quick and then I'll tell you the rest of the vision because I really believe God is doing this with his church again. Because God's been talking to me a lot, even in San Diego, and bringing it up again about what he's doing in this in time. And it's Matthew 8, verse 20. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. And in the vision, I seen Jesus. And he laid his head down on the lap of his bride. And I said, God, what are you showing me in this vision? And I was just weeping, crying because I felt it so strong. He says, I'm looking for somewhere to lay my government. I'm looking for somewhere that I could give my authority to. I'm looking for somewhere that I could give my counsel. So he's looking for somewhere to lay his head, to rest. And I believe that God is bringing his government. It's already, his government's here through the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven is here, on earth as it is in heaven. I don't even need to go about this thing. Because yeah. then I'm going to get in the preaching mode and I'm in a teaching mode. This is God's government. We are the facilitators in God's government. We are the ones with the power and the authority. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places. That's more than one. Places where we rule and reign above all principalities and powers. The problem is 
The church doesn't know it, and I don't understand why, because it's all throughout the Word of God. So Jesus is looking for a place to lay his head. And I saw that in the vision. I was like, God, that is so amazing that we are sitting in the government of God. We are seated. And we have the seven spirits of God. Counsel, counsel wisdom. Counsel, wisdom, understanding, the anointing of might. Can you imagine? We have access to the seven spirits of God. Even John said, I see Jesus and his seven spirits. <laughs> So we don't teach on this. So God is looking for a place to lay his head. God says in his word that he's looking for a habitation in us. He's looking for a place of rest. <laughs> that he could rest in us so that he could be who he is in the earth. And so this is why he's bringing us to this place where we will be cleansed and sanctified. So he can use us for his glory. You know, and a lot of people say, and I don't want to, I'm not, I don't want to make it look like, you know, because I have a lot of changing to do. I'm just obeying God right now by giving you guys this. I'm like, Lord, you know, what's going on here? Because, <laughs> you know, i got to teach the same thing I taught, whether I had 50 people or nine. That's the way God wants me to do it. And I've been putting this off because I thought, well, they're not coming tonight. Or they're not, I'm not putting it off no more. God said to record it, do it, and get it out there because he's going to use it for his glory. And he's going to bring his bride, whether it's us or someone else. She's going to be without spot and without wrinkle. And she's being sanctified right now. And he's bringing her up out of the wheelchair. And he's placing his government in her. And she's going to rule and reign in this earth once again because she's not right now. She's not. She's become a formalized religion. Her eyes have been gouged out. She's invalid and in a wheelchair. And God wants to bring her back again to her full estate. And that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I really believe that through Lilies of the Valley. I believe God's going to use Lilies of the Valley to bring the Bride of Christ. Because our calling is to gather the Bride of Christ mm -hmm. and to present her to Him. To gather her, bring sanctification to her through the Holy Spirit, and present her. And that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And so... This is what the Lord's put on my heart, and this, this is just something that I taught in San Diego, and it's very, very hard, and it may not be a pretty message, <laughs> but it's truth. It's truth, and we all need to change. And uh, I, just, I just really want to obey the Lord because there's, there's, I really want you guys to agree with me in prayer because there's an attack that God showed me that is on Barb's life. And I'm going to break it off of her. And the devil's a liar. And so can you come up here and stand with me? In the name of Jesus right now. Satan, you're a liar. You have no power. You have no authority. Every lie, act, or deed. Right now in the name of Jesus. You witchcraft spirit, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I command you by the authority of heaven through the blood of the cross right now. To bow at his presence. You have no rights. In Jesus name. And I speak healing virtue from on high. To come into her body. From the top of her head. To the soles of her feet. To the tips of her toes. In Jesus name. And she'll be rejuvenated God. Strengthened by your power and your might Father. I thank you that you're taking her into the sanctification process. In a deeper way. I thank you that she's been delivered, Father God, yes. from any form of medications in Jesus' name. Yes. I thank you that you're making her whole right now yes. in the name of Jesus. I speak to every fiber of her being, God, that you have masterfully formed. I speak health and wholeness yes. to every blood cell. I speak to her blood in the name of Jesus. Wholeness and peace. Rest, peace, rest, peace, and rest. We cover her. Hallelujah, under your head, Jesus. And Father, what you desire to do, God, that you've spoken even beforehand, shall surely come to pass. And I thank you that the enemy has no power over it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Wow. And I'm going to give you this here that the Lord had me do today for you. But I'm going to read it first. Because how many know the end result is good? <laughs> We look so much better in the future than we do right now. Who said that? Uh, one of the great prophets. <laughs> we do. So this woman, representing the overcoming church in Revelation 2, is given a white stone with a new name written on it. The white stone is symbolic of priestly revelation. The new name reveals her true calling and her true destiny. Isaiah 62 speaks of her shining like the dawn and the, of, a, of having a crown of beauty in the Lord's hand. It also says that her land will no longer be desolate and the dark cliffs in the foreground represent her former home and the hills covered in castles and her new abiding place. She is clothed in a royal robe and adorned in gold, symbolizing her royalty and kingdom glory. <coughs> this right here is where the bride of Christ <coughs> is going. And I love you enough to tell you everything I told you tonight. Otherwise, my love is, is un it's supposed to have unfeigned love. My love means nothing to you if I can't tell you the truth. If I just say I love you and I have no action behind it, I don't love you. That's a lot. So these are for you. And I went and got these frames. They're not the greatest, so you can always frame it and put another frame. But I used a little money that I had to get these frames. And I just figured they're perfect, you know, yeah. for what they want to say. Wow, thank you. It's amazing what you spoke. And he said to me tonight, I didn't want to speak those words because I didn't want to make it like a reality. Because <laughs> I'm going, like, no, that's not right. That's not right. That can't be happening. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Yes, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you. all him. He loves you. And I got Joanne's and uh, Jasmine's. I got. I did ten of them. The Lord's do ten of them. So ten's redemption. Hmm. And I know we're always going to have a lot more, but I gave these out in San Diego, and I had that on my prayer wall in the prayer center, and I believe that. Yeah. And I still believe that. And it's still a reality. This is the Lord's bride. This is who we are. This is who we are. Okay? And we have got to start seeing ourselves in the end revelation. If we do not see ourselves in the end result, we will fail. Philippians 1 6, God will finish the work that He began in you until the day of Christ Jesus. Jesus will finish the work in you. Jesus, until the day of Christ Jesus. So you have to remember that, okay? So we don't believe in condemnation because those who are in Christ have no condemnation, but we do believe in renewal. We do believe in repentance, and we do believe that God is cleansing us, right? Are you guys with me? Yep. He's cleansing us and he's bringing us into an estate where we can receive him fully. And I don't, know, I don't know about you, but I want that more than anything. Nothing else matters in this world. Nothing else really matters. There's nothing that can give you the pleasure that Jesus Christ can give you. Ever. Ever. And so, uh, go with that. If anybody wants prayer, I'll pray for you. Um, this Friday, I'm really looking forward to it. God already told me what he's going to do. There's going to be some very powerful uh, plucking up and planting. Plucking up and planting. And I really, really want to be a light for God to use us as well down there. Yeah. Who knows? The lady's very, very awesome. Yeah. She just, you know, every time I say, hi, this is, this is Julie. Oh, I know who you are. I don't say anything. I was just like, wow, she remembers my voice? <laughs> it's crazy. That's got to be God. You know, and I believe God's going to come connect us. And so, um, if you, if you know like anything. to see her name and, and, and that healing center in with this woman that I used to go to yes. when I first became a Christian and took her classes and took her what was called SWAT training, spiritual wire and assault training or something, the SWAT, and about, yeah, 
Yeah, I've so seen that up here in Kingman, the SWAT training. Yeah, I did that. Wow. Yeah. So this um, this place is pretty good. 